So, here's my proposition. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. If you can do it, you get 300 million. There's got to be a catch. Of course there's a catch. You have to spend the 30 million. But after 30 days, you're not allowed to own any assets. No houses, no cars, no jewelry. Nothing but the shirt on your back. <laughs> so it sounds easy, don't it? Well, you'll find out. <laughs> you can hire anybody you want, but you've got to get value for their services. You can donate 5% to charity and you can gamble another 5% away, but you can't give this money away, and that includes buying the Hope Diamond for some bimbo as a birthday present. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. You're not allowed to tell anybody why you have to spend this money. I'll pay you $2,000 a week to be the chief of my security. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, that's wrong. Okay, $4,000 a week. And you get 20 other guys, and I'll pay them $3,000 a week. Mr. Point. Now go in there and get the $3 million, and follow me. Yes, sir. Everybody follow me. You spend the money. Listen to me. This is Spike. This is Joe Powell. You don't do things like that. You don't do things like that. We're running for a cheaper than that. I'll tell you what's going on. You don't even know those people. Listen to me. They're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm not. you got to stick with me, because this is it. This is the way we're going to beat the system. What system? It's a rooster. It's a rooster. It's a rooster. Could you please give us your reasons for your sudden and unexpected candidacy? I figure voting for Salvino or Heller is just as silly as them running for office, which is just as silly as me running for office. The only thing not silly is the power of the people's vote. And I think the people should use it to vote for um, <laughs> none of the above. Ten days, Mr. Brewster, with only ten days left before the election. How do you expect to find that kind of support for that position? I don't expect to get support. In fact, I'm asking people not to send money into my candidacy. I think the people should keep their money. They're going to need it after this election. Some mistakes get made, that's all right, that's okay In the end it's better for me, that's the moral of the story, babe I think a movie is a true classic if the jokes told in the movie hold up 40 years later and are just as relevant. I mean, the very thought of an election where you would say, I think the two of them running is just as silly as me voting for either one of them, may be coming true here soon. And then the other line of, keep your money, you're going to need it after this election. Uh, classic. But the, the movie was about a, uh, a story. We love these kind of easy money uh, treasure kind of stories that the whole movie was about, where if you accomplish this task, $300 million is coming your way. But you can't tell anybody about what you're doing. They, won't, you know, they can't understand it. They can't know what you're doing. And this is a great parallel for a parable that Jesus tells. We're going to be looking at this morning out of Matthew 13. And he's hitting on our love for fortunate finds, buried treasure, um, easy money kind of things. We love movies that deal with this topic. I mean, how many movies are there that follow the storyline of somebody who finds a fortune somewhere. We will watch sequel after sequel after sequel of these, uh, even if it's about some shifty-eyed pirate who kind of makes some odd decisions in his personal, personal life, but that's kind of a different story. Uh, we will watch movies about archaeologists who run around the world with a whip in their hand to look for some buried treasure, or a shapely one with a pair of a nine millimeters who also does the same kind of thing, but are on her own way. Uh, we will watch movies about the fact that maybe our founding fathers hid clues to a treasure map all over our founding documents. We will watch these kind of movies because we love them. Uh, we love the idea of this buried treasure. Uh, we watch reality shows with this very same topic in mind, whether it's trying to find some buried treasure in a storage shed that's been abandoned, or somebody brings it into a pawn shop, or the antique road show. I mean, there is story after story after story, American pickers of these buried treasure finds. We like these kind of things, and Jesus picks up on our love for this, which is not a new thing, it's an old thing too, when he gives this parable we're going to be looking at in Matthew 13. And while in our day, buried treasures are sometimes found like in the form of a classic car in a barn or in a safety deposit box, back in that day, they actually had buried treasure. It was a very common thing. As a matter of fact, when Jesus tells another parable, not the one we're going to look at this morning, but a different one, over in Matthew 25, he mentions a, uh, there was a 
wealthy owner who gives three of his servants some weights of, a, of money, whether it be gold, silver, we're not really sure, and one of them gets five, one gets two, one gets one weight, and the one who has a weight of, of some amount of five takes it and he invests it. The one who has the two, he invests it. What's the guy do with who was only given one? What's he do with it? He buries it. That's what they did because they didn't have safety deposit boxes. They didn't have a home safe. They didn't have like a big metal box. You could lock things up with a combo lock. You didn't have that thousands of years ago. The only way you could make sure nobody got the stuff that you wanted to keep to yourself was to go bury it somewhere where only you knew where it was. Well, then what happens if that person dies or gets arrested or disappears? What happens to that? It just stays there in the ground for somebody else to find. And so it was a very common thing. And so Jesus brings up this concept when he's talking in Matthew 13. We've been looking at a lot of parables out of Matthew 13 on the uh, the parables he tells about the kingdom of heaven. So he tells another kingdom of heaven parable from a different perspective. And he says this, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And in his joy, he went and sold all he had and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who went looking for fine pearls. By the way, pearls back in that day and time was equivalent to like what our diamonds are now. That was the gem of choice back in their time. So he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who went looking for fine pearls. And when he found it, one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, before I begin, I got to, maybe you haven't had a chance to process it enough. However, if you process it for a little while, there may be some of you, probably not in this church, but there may be some of you who reads this and goes... I have an ethical issue with this. I mean, the guy finds the treasure, he then buries it, doesn't tell anybody, and then he goes and he buys the field from the guy who doesn't know about the treasure, and isn't that kind of like half shifty? And some of you are thinking, finders keepers, man, I don't see what the problem is. Others of you, though, are like, well, it just seems a little, I don't know, off. So much so that uh, there's a guy, Randy Alcorn, who's writ- written several good books uh, on heaven, and he also wrote a book, a little short mini book, on just this parable. It was called The Treasure Principle. And he had so many people write in about this ethical issue, about the guy who bar- you know, finds the treasure and buries it and then goes and buys it, that he posts one of the emails that he gets, and he feels like he needs to address it once and for all on his author site. And I just wanted to read you the email that he posts, and I have to read it, oh, I don't know, in the voice that I read it in. And I signed it with a person who I think wrote it. Okay, so I know that the parables of Jesus were ones that everybody could relate to, but this parable about the man finding the treasure in the field that he doesn't own and then hides it away without telling anybody, especially uh, the owner or anyone else, just so he can buy it and possess the treasure, I'm very troubled by this example. (laughs) I know Jesus wouldn't teach us to do something unethical. I mean, if I were to find a treasure on your property and not tell you, and then buy your property from you just so I could reap the benefits of the treasure that was on your property, wouldn't that be considered unethical? That's not something I would do. Sincerely, Karen. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Karen? Is it fair to say you're missing the point? You're, you're missing the point of what this parable is all about. He's not talking about the ethics of finders keepers in this parable. That's not at all what the parable is about. However, in reading it, I had to laugh because if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks and learning about why Jesus used parables, the very fact that she's missing the point was kind of the point of why he was using a parable in the first place. Because people like this aren't anything new. As a matter of fact, there were people like this listening to Jesus tell it originally, and it says the reason why I tell parables is so that people who are, have this sort of, I don't know, pious sense of religious legalism will not listen to anything I say. I mean, think about the degree of pious religious legalism you have to have to want to give Jesus a lecture on ethics. Let that sink in just for a minute. That's what this lady's doing. She doesn't have a problem with Randy's book. She has a problem with the parable that Jesus told that Randy writes the book about. Anytime you think that you are more religiously ethical than Jesus, you probably should ask yourself, am I being a legalist? Maybe I have a problem. Just a question, I don't know. You're probably not listening to anything I say because you're going to judge this message from the start. That's fine. 
But those were the people who were listening to Jesus back in his day, and he purposes, we've been talking about, would tell parables to both reveal truth and to conceal truth. And this is a perfect example of how the truth of this parable is totally lost on this person. It's totally concealed from their view. They have no idea what Jesus is talking about because they're so hung up on the ethics of whether or not he should have done something different with it. But can we just pause for a moment and say, the unethical, I mean, the true unethical thing to do would have been to just take the treasure and walk away, right? Nothing was stopping that. Or take a portion of the treasure, sell that to then go back and buy the field so then you can legitimately own it. I mean, there's a lot of other more unethical things he could have done. You're going to pick on this, a little odd. And I want to read this and I go, lady, if you have a problem with this parable, you should read more of the Bible. You're not going to want to read what you get. You're, if this is having a problem, you're going to be triggered when you read Luke 16. In Luke 16, he tells a parable about the shrewd manager. Maybe you know that one. Uh, this is a parable, very similar point he's trying to make over there that I'm sure this person's not going to get either. In that parable, it's about a guy who's going to get fired at the end of the day because he's mismanaged the financial accounts of his manager. And so because he realizes he's got about four hours left on the clock before he's going to get fired, he goes and he reaches out to all of the people who owe his boss a lot of money. And he slashes what they owe in half, all of them. Hey, hey, Remember, I did this for you, man. You got to come back and do something. If I ever asked you for a favor, you remember you owe me one. You owe me one. You owe me one. And Jesus, at the end of the parable, he says, I wish you people were more like him. Huh? I mean, if you're triggered by this, which it may or may not be shady, Jesus flat out goes to the most shady individual possible. I almost picture this lady in that Jesus' time asking him about this parable, and he's like, oh, you had a problem with that one? Well, I understand. Let me give you a better parable. And then he goes to like a guy who's even clearly more shady than that. So what is the point of these parables? Is Jesus just, you know, down for a good hustle? I mean, is he, is he down for, you know, somebody who's going to kind of do whatever? Is that really the point? No. No. What, what, what it is, is Jesus looking at me saying, I see how cunningly creative people are. I see how hard people are willing to work to get what they want, even something that is as temporal as money, even something that shouldn't even be gotten. I see how they are willing to, by hook or by crook, find a way to get done what it is that they want to be done, all for something that they value to be of real importance, whether it be to have a job next week after I lose this one or to find the most amazing gem that the world has ever seen so I can be in possessor of the hope diamond or whatever it is of the day, or whether it be of this buried treasure so I can live life and be living large and look at the extremes that somebody would go to get that kind of thing. He says, I wish you would take that same energy and effort and use it towards that which really matters most. That's the point he's trying to get across. Now, it's going to be completely lost on somebody who's focused on these other things. And purposely, he wants those kind of people to just miss it and move on so he can really talk to those who need to listen. Now, if you were to begin to value the kingdom of heaven and realize its worth, what would that look like in your life? How would that impact what you do with your time? How would that impact what you do with your relationships? How would that impact with what you do with your money? How would that impact what career you choose? I mean, think of all the implications that that could possibly have it would completely reorient your world. Now, if you did get so radical as to really buy into it being worth it, what would your friends around you say? That's where I go back to that Brewster's Million story. None of his, like John Candy, his best friend there is trying to talk him out of it, saying, you can't do this. This is crazy. You're just, you're wasting all your, your money. This is worthless endeavor. And he's like, no, 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 no. You got to trust me on this. You got to trust me on this. It will be worth it. And he's doing all of that for a $300 million payoff. Jesus is saying, I wish you would work in that same manner or possibility. Now, it's funny how hard you will work to get something when you realize what a deal it is. Like, if I were to tell you right now, um, a friend of mine's got a Porsche. It's only one year old, and he's willing to sell it. Anybody interested? In this demographic, there may be one or two of you go, hmm, send me the info. The rest of you are like, no, uh, that's a little out of my pay grade. What if I told you this car right now is a valuation of about 80000 he's willing to sell it for 3000 Whether you have $3,000 in your pocket right now or not, 
by the end of the week, I'd be willing to bet a lot of y'all could come up with three grand, right? You'd find a way to get that hustle done, right? And Jesus is looking at that and saying, that's the kind of hustle I would love to see you have if you understood the value of the kingdom of heaven. That you would look at it in that same way of, oh my goodness, what a payoff this is going to be. It's going to be so worth it. Now, what he's trying to get across is the message of, if you only knew how short life was, if you only knew how long eternity was, if you only knew what heaven was like, you'd be hustling like that shrewd manager, you'd be hustling like that merchant, you'd be hustling like that digger who found that stuff in the ground, because it's going to be so worth it. I said this, I mentioned this in one of the services a couple weeks ago, nobody's going to get hosed in heaven, okay? Nobody's going to get there and go, really, this is it? I, 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 thought, it, I, I thought it would be a little better, I thought it would be more. I, I <laughs> I don't know. It's like as if the, the Bible was kind of like one of them photographers with the wide angle lens and the right lighting or something, you know, like maybe the weather is bright and sunny like two days in Seattle, but that's not really what it looks like here. Uh, mansion? I think that was some creative realtor speak, right? You know, how, how realtors always describe the property waterfront views. It's a septic canal, right? You know, it's <laughs> mansion. Hey, this is a dorm room, right? I mean, I wouldn't call this a mansion. I mean, maybe if you were living in a cardboard box, maybe this is some sort of plush. Eh, I should have partied it up more, honestly. <laughs> Jesus is saying, nobody is going to be saying that when they get there. Oh, oh, oh over in, there's a guy named Paul. Uh, who actually got to go preview heaven and come back, and he was forbidden to tell us the details about it, but he kind of let some things slip out. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, let me just let you in here. No eyes ever seen, no ears ever heard, no mind can possibly imagine what it is going to be like. Somebody once put it this way to me. Look around, and how many beautiful things have you seen in this world? I mean, waterfalls, sunsets, whether you've seen them in person or you've seen them only in pictures, uh, majestic animals. Uh, if you've studied biology and you just see the wonderment and the amazement of the, the interrelations of all of the ecosystems and how they combine and how they work together. Uh, if you've ever looked into astronomy and the beauty that surrounds us throughout the universe. And you pause for a moment. This is what somebody once said to me. It says in the scriptures that God spent a week doing all of that. All of that was created by him in a week, and he took one day off. How long has he been spending? It's been a couple thousand years now he's, since he's been working on the heaven that is to come. What could that kind of creative mind and power do? If, that's what he, if this is what he does in a week, what is that going to look like? Just getting your mind around that literally will blow your mind. You cannot conceive of what that kind of creative power and intellect could do and come up with given that much time. And Jesus says, I'm going away, and I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Now, I can build a house in a year or two, and I'm not a very good carpenter, and I don't have a whole lot. What do you think somebody with infinite creativity and infinite expense and infinite time now could do to create for you? If you understood it, you would see it as the pearl. You would see it as the, as the treasure. You would go work whatever hustle you could to get it. And so Paul is somebody who went there and got to come back. Later on another book he writes uh, to, the, to the church in, in Philippi. And in Philippians 1, verse 21, he says this. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's, he's communicating the same principle that Jesus is talking about here. And he goes on because he's on death row. And typically when somebody's on death row, what do they want most? A pardon. Well, since Paul's already seen what's on the other side, he says... I'll be honest with you, what I want most is not a pardon. I really just want God to go ahead and take me there because, man, that place was cool, awesome. Like, wouldn't you like to live on vacation? He's like, that's what it was like. I got to live in the mansion on vacation. But I know God still wants me here, so I'm probably going to be sticking around for a while. So for me, while I'm here, to live is Christ. And when I die, it's going to be so worth it. He says, for me to die is gain. This concept you will see throughout scriptures. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing this message, I, I just, those are only, like, normally I put like two or three verses up. 
I couldn't like leave stuff out and I kept finding more and more and more and I kind of got a little carried away, but there's far, there's like three times more than what I put up there versus on this topic out there. Um, I can't even, is this one up there, Mark 9, uh, yeah, Mark 9, 41. He says, I tell you, anyone who gives a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. I mean, just even the littlest thing that you would give in his name is a reward. Now, what's a cup of water worth? Like a dollar? I guess it depends on where you're at. The airport, six dollars, right? <laughs> he says that would be worth it. It would be worth it if people were in need of the airport for you to buy everybody in the airport water. It'd be so worth it. Um, or there's another verse that's kind of almost, I don't know, it's comforting but kind of has like a little bit of a hook that's kind of like messes with a little bit. Uh, 2 John 1.8, he says, Watch yourselves, you don't lose what you've accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. What word in there kind of makes you go, huh? Did you pick up on it? That word full reward? What's sort of the backdoor implication of that? There are some who will receive a full reward. There are some who may receive very any reward. There's some who are going to be receiving a partial reward. Over in 1 Corinthians 3, if you put, the, put the, some, some of this stuff together, put 1 Corinthians 3, he says, there'll be some who are saved, but only as ones escaping through the flames of hell. Like, they, they barely get in the door. There's like the Indiana Jones movie where, like, he's, like, rolling through, like, this closing door, and he reaches back and grabs his whip, you know, that kind of thing. I always sort of pictured that's kind of the person who barely gets in. There's, like, the, the bottom of the clothes kind of singed by hell as they're walking in the door. And I'm just happy to be here. They're there. Don't get me wrong. It's going to be great. But there's also going to be that sense of your look around, you go, oh man, I could have had so much more. The potential and the opportunity I had. It, it's, if you've seen the movie Schindler's List, at the very end of the movie, he's looking around and realizing, he, what he realizes is economically, about every $100, uh, or each employee that he has, and all the employees that worked for him, their lives were spared from the Nazi Holocaust. And he begins to realize where it came out to be was it cost about $100 to save a life. And he looks down at his ring and he thinks to himself, this ring was $600. I could have saved six people if I didn't have this ring. He looks at his car and he thinks, you know, $5,000 for this car, you know, all these people I could have saved if I didn't spend my money. And he looks at all of the money he wasted. And God says, I don't want you to get there and look back over your life and go, oh, all that was wasted. Rather, I want you to look at this and realize the potential and the opportunity you have for the reward at hand, that you might live your life in such a way that you would do whatever you can to get it. Now, the issue of these parables is all about value. Now, the thing about value is it's subjective. We value things differently. We place different values on things, and that's what Jesus is hitting on. He understands that we value things differently. So, for instance, that's, by the way, that's the reason why marriages argue over money, because we value how to use that money differently. One person in the relationship may value a fishing pole as being much more valuable use of our money than new furniture. And, and the other one says, well, no, no, no. It's much more important for our family that we get furniture than a new fishing pole. To which you would come back and you'd say, yeah, what are we going to do with the couch? Let the kids sit on it and waste their life away? With a fishing pole, we can feed our children. I can use it to teach them to fish. And if I do that, they could fish for a lifetime. And yet you just want a couch? These are valuation conversations. Right? I'm not proposing one of them. I'm just telling you how the valuation conversation goes. And so what you value is what you will spend money on. And what Jesus is saying, what I notice is that people don't place a high value on heaven or on the heaven's reward. They will spend a lot of time on a hustle for a treasure or a pearl. But don't seem to spend much time on a hustle to increase the reward on the other side, which will be so worth it. Other thing about valuation I was thinking through is uh, houses, housing prices. Like, how much does a house cost? I don't know. It's, it's hard to know. It's so subjective. I mean, you'll, you'll look on Zillow and they'll have one price for your house. You'll talk to a realtor. They'll do some market comparison and they come up with a different price for your house. The city assessor, he's come up with a different price for your house. That he's going to tax you based on whether that's fair or not. Uh, the bank, when you go get a loan, they're going to do assessment. They're going to tell you what they think your house is worth. Uh, if a friend of yours, you know, maybe come over and say, here's what I'd be willing to give you for your house. But in the end of the day, I can tell you with my house, none of those are an accurate valuation of my house. Because for my house, I built my house. I mean, I literally, it was, it was something I always wanted to do was build my own house. And so I built the house. And I, I, you can't put a price tag on that for me, right? Uh, because 
for me, my house is more than just the house. It's, it's a memory. Like as I go into each room, this is literally something I have. I go in a room and I will remember the, the work that it took to design the HVAC system and build it. A lot of work. That's why they charge so much. Trust me, it's a lot of work. I remember pulling the wires. And as I would flip on switches, it happens all the time. I'll flip on a switch and I'll think to myself, yeah, that wire goes right up this wall, goes right over there, goes to there. And man, that was a really hard thing to get around that thing over there. I have memories in every room in the house. On top of that, I have memories of the people who were there with me who helped me build the house. I didn't do it all by myself. Many of you all in this room and several other friends of mine uh, helped me build it. And so I will be walking on my back deck and I'll be thinking about those who helped me build that deck or finish the drywall. And it's so it's, it's, I have memory after memory that nobody else would have in that place. But most of all with the house is it took me a little over a year to do it. And there were a lot of long, hot, hard, lonely nights. Uh, I was thinking just July 4th weekend, I remember one year, I was working on my HVAC. Fun time to be in the attic of an unair conditioned house. Yeah. And I remember watching car after car just you know, be streaming out to the beach and all these people having fun and pool parties going on and I didn't get to do any of that stuff. And I forgo all of those opportunities because in the back of my mind, I was like, this is going to be worth it. And I would go sit in what was at the time just a room, you know, like a, a wooden floor with just studs. And I would just, I would go and I'd put my, my little folding chair or lawn chair, whatever I had there. And I would face the wall, which was just studs at the time, and about the position where I was going to put a couch someday. And I would close my eyes and picture watching a football game. Hopefully one where my team would actually win. You know, and I'd look out the window and I would, you know, picture what it would be like on a day where I can just sit there and relax and just enjoy the view. And it was that vision that fueled me to continue to work and not want to just pack it up and quit. And now here's the most euphoric thing. There are days now where I will sit there on that couch, which is now in that room with the TV in front of it, enjoying a show with my family, and I'll remember back to the day in which I was working hard to make this happen and thinking to myself, it really was worth it. The hard work really was worth it and I would do it all again. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> but I would do it again so I can enjoy this now. And, and I can't describe that. I think you know where I'm going with this. That's sort of what Jesus is trying to get across here. Selling everything you have to get this treasure, you're going to have some moments where you question your sanity, right? Is it really worth it? Was that treasure really as good as I thought it was going to be? You're going to have moments where it's a lot of hustle and a lot of work to get there. But there will come a day when you're sitting in heaven and you look back and you remember those moments of what it took to get there and you'll go, wow, I'm glad I did this. So, so glad I did this. I realize now that as I kind of get to this part of the message, I kind of skipped over a very crucial part in parable study. And it, we have been, we've been trying to talk about not just what the parable means, but also trying to give you some Bible study tools as you read the parables. One of the things we really need to do is I kind of had to get to that Karen letter. I couldn't resist that one. But one of the things you have to do in any parable is you have to ask yourself the question, who does each person represent? I kind of made an assumption there, so let's go back. And in other words, who does each person represent or what does each item represent? So going back, let's just go, we've got a digger, uh, like a digger out of the field. We've got a digger and we've got a merchant. Who does that represent? Who does that represent? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> Y'all think every question's a trick question, so... Like, we've been in one of your sermons before, Steve. No. <laughs> who is the digger? Who is the pearl? Us. Thank you. Anybody agree? Us, right? What is the treasure? Heaven. Heaven. Thank you. And see, so y'all are sitting there like, who's the, who, who's the digger? I know the correct answer in church is always Jesus. <laughs> but I think it's me, but it might sound selfish if I said me, so somebody else go first. Us? Yeah, us, us, us. I concur. I concur. Us? Well, maybe it actually was Jesus. Let's reread the parable. <laughs> see, every question I do ask is a setup. I'm sorry. It always is. You, see, those of you who are new, you don't know that I set up these questions. I lead you right down a path and purposely just to yank it out from underneath you. So let's reread the parable, only this time put Jesus as the digger or the merchant. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. 
When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away, he sold everything he had, and bought it. If Jesus is the digger of the merchant, who or what is the treasure of the pearl? Us. Yeah. Do you have anything to back that up? I got a few up there. Uh, let's go through just a couple of them. Um, Exodus 19. Uh, you indeed, if you, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, in other words, we have a relationship, you will be my treasured possession, it says in Exodus 19. Uh, or Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7. The uh, Lord has chosen you to be a people for his prized possession. Deuteronomy 14. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his prized possession. Uh, Deuteronomy 26. Uh, he has proclaimed that you are his people, a treasured possession. Over in the New Testament, same thing. He brings back the same idea, the same concept, carries it over. First Peter chapter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priest, and a holy nation, God's special possession. Over in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. There is a lot of documentation here that Jesus looks at you as being a treasure worth giving up everything he has that he might obtain a relationship with you. And the way that I talk about how this life is about nothing more than a loving relationship with Jesus Christ who's joined you for all eternity, is it not also true that when Jesus came here that his life was about nothing more than establishing, developing, growing, creating, having, wanting a loving relationship with you that he might be able to enjoy for all eternity? You can, you can read it. The reason why the Son of Man came was to seek and save the lost. He did not come to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. That whoever's relationship with him might not be condemned, but have an everlasting life. You can read it. It's all through there. The reason why he came is because you were his treasure possession. You were his pearl of great price. He was hustling as hard as he could possibly work, doing everything he possibly could, so that he might have a relationship with you, take care of every barrier, every obstacle between you and him. He's the merchant. He's the digger. Or is he? Actually, he's not. In this telling of the parable, you are actually the merchant, you are actually the digger. However, here's the thing. Jesus has led the way in exactly what he wants you and I to do. And in a beautiful relationship, it's not a beautiful relationship, one where two people value each other more than themselves. They're willing to give up everything they have for the other person. That's what he's talking about. Jesus has... has sought us out as his treasure possession. And he says, oh, if only you would see me as your treasure possession too. Because you're my treasure possession, I will do everything I can and give my entire life. I will even descend into hell on your behalf. I will give up my very life for you because you are that for me. And if, oh, if you could only realize, if you could only see, that's what I am to you. If you could only value me the way I value you. Matthew 16 Jesus says to the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. For what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anybody give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Do you see this? It's right there. Same way he values us, he says, I wish you'd value me. And in the same way that he's given his life for us, he's calling us to give our life for him. In the same way he took up his cross to die for our sins, he's calling on us to take up our cross for him. We might give our life for him. Now, I can't preach this whole message without using the rope. If you've been here before, you know what I'm talking about. It's just such a crucial message. It's so essential to everything that we do, everything the scriptures say. I always leave this rope up here. Um, if you haven't been here before, this is something, something new to you. For those of you who know what this is, but you probably forget because often we do forget. Picture this entire rope representing all of eternity. You know, from the start of your life all the way till your very last day of existence, whenever that may or may not be. And if this rope it represents all of eternity that you'd spend with God, because that's a one loving relationship you'd last for all eternity. How long is your life in comparison to all this? 
This is probably too big of a thing, but I had to get at least big enough that you could see it from where, maybe where you're at. This would be it, cradle to grave right here. And I've got three little segments here. This first little segment's while you're in school. And I know that feels like an eternity. Like you will never graduate whatever kind of schooling you're in. You'll always be a kid. You'll never get there. You'll never get that degree. That's true of your loans, but not necessarily true of the time. <laughs> this next blue section is kind of like your working years where you get a career, you build a life, whatever it may be, whatever your concept of building a life or family or whatever that is, that's kind of your blue you know, section right there, your career. And then eventually you're kind of working. So you're working this whole red time so you can get to the blue time. I'm working all in school so I can get a good career, a good life. You work the whole life so you can do what? Get that retirement, right? Social Security, 401k, Roth, whatever it might be. You know, 20 years of the Navy, they give me the rest of my life and I can retire and never do, have to do anything, sort of. <laughs> you just want to be able to enjoy this time right here, but then your body's so old and broken you barely can. Then it's over. That's it. We spend, unfortunately, so much of our life hustling for this. And Jesus, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant or, or a digger who realizes the treasure that's out there and he spends all of this right here hustling with everything he has for this over here. Because I left this here and I'm giving all of this for you so we can enjoy this over here. And I so desperately wish you would do the same because it's that worth it. It's that worth it. I gotta say one last thing in closing though. There are some who will say, oh man, if heaven is so amazing, can't I just skip to the front of the line and go there right now? I gotta address this because suicide has this line of thought. If somebody commits suicide, it doesn't mean that they don't go to heaven with God. If they have a relationship with God, you go no matter what. That's what the promise is all about. However, did you notice there is a difference between the reward that's available in heaven? There is a full reward, there's a partial reward, and there's some who escape as only one barely getting in, right? When somebody commits suicide, what happens is they walk into heaven and God's like, I'm so glad you're here. But at some point in the process, when they go over the review of their life and says, okay, let's just say you did it at age 30, God looks down at you and you realize, oh man, God wanted me to be here another 40 years. There was 40 years of work left to do, and I'm forfeiting all of that reward for all of eternity. Am I still there? Yes. But you will look back and you will regret that decision in the same way if you're still here and you're just going through life and existing and not using it for anything and you've already checked out of this life because you don't think you can amount to anything or your life as you thought it was going to be or everything you wanted to have for that next section or the next section isn't working out the way you planned it and you just want to just give up right now and just quit on life and you're just going to sit here and exist for the next 30, 40 years or 10 years, whatever it is, in the same way you'll get there and go, oh, I wasted it, I wasted it, I wasted it. If you would see it for the value it is and the reward that is there and the potential, you'd be working that hustle. You'd be working that hustle. And Jesus says, I hope you do. I hope you do. I hope you're like that merchant. I hope you're like that digger. I hope you come back and you really work it because it will be so worth it. Will you join us as we close our time in prayer? Father, I just ask so that we might be able to get this understand this, see this, get the vision of this, let this sink in deep into within our soul. Father, it is so easy to just be focusing on what comes next, getting through the summer, getting through this next year, getting this next degree, getting this next promotion, just getting to vacation, whatever it may be, Lord. When your whole time here, you were never thinking about any of those short-sighted things. You were always keeping the end in mind. Your focus was always on eternity. It was always on redeeming the lost, always on saving our souls that you might have a relationship with us, and you've done everything in your power to make that happen. And what I see you communicating here is a deep desire that we might have that same drive to have a relationship with you that you've had for us, that we might truly live for eternity and live for that relationship here and now. So, Father, may we not live in regret of what we've missed out on already, but may, Father, we look to the future with repentance and where we will go from now to make sure that we are living it every day from this point forward to receive that full reward from here on out. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.